Good morning, everybody. Great to see you. Thanks for being here. I know this is one of those Sundays where it takes a little bit extra, you know, like feeling that extra hour um, or the deficiency thereof. And um, we're glad that you are here with us today. Uh, my name is John. I have the great honor of being one of the pastors here. And we are in week five of our series, The Lord's Prayer. We've been looking through this prayer that Jesus gave to his disciples of how to pray with the right posture and with the right petitions. This example, this template that he gave so we would know how to pray to our Heavenly Father. And when I first heard that we were doing this series, I was excited about this message. Don't get me wrong, the whole thing is great. Uh, but this was the one that I felt, man, I can't wait till we get an opportunity to go through this with our people. Um, this is one of those things that has a real power to change people's lives. And I believe that God wants to change some lives here today. I believe that God wants to take some of the burdens that some of us have been carrying for a long time off of our shoulders, and I believe that he wants to change our lives. I believe that that will have a ramification around our church, because as we're able to embrace what we're talking about today and apply it and extend it to each other, I believe that that has a dramatic effect on our community here at Centerpoint, and that will change the way that we are a witness and a light and salt right here on this island and beyond. So there's lots at stake today, and I'm, I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to dive into it with all of you, because today we're talking about forgiveness. <clears throat> Let's take a deep breath in. <sighs> forgiveness. We're going to be all right. Let's dive right into what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to read the whole prayer, um, and we'll, uh, we'll highlight the part that we're going to cover. But if you're brand new to all of this, maybe you're familiar a little bit with the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and a crowd is gathering on a mountain. He's teaching them about the kingdom of God, and this is the prayer that he's giving them. And so this is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6. He says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, set apart, special be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Forgiveness. C.S. Lewis, the 20th century author, philosopher, theologian, he said, everybody thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. <laughs> I found that to be true. I think that part of the reason why we get so tripped up when it comes to forgiveness is not just because it's difficult, but because we've kind of alloyed it with all these other things that are not forgiveness. We get confused about what it is, and we let these ideas contaminate this idea of forgiveness. And so we're actually aiming at something that's often not what God is talking about here in this passage. And so what I want to do is I want to, before we dive into everything else, I want to just talk about what is forgiveness and then I want to start by saying what forgiveness is not. So these are a few things. We'll have them on the screen behind me. But the first thing is that forgiveness is not easy. Uh, maybe you had some well-intentioned Christian come along to you over the years and say, hey, you got to let go and let God. Or God works all things together for good. Hey, you're to forgive because God forgave you. All of that is true. The problem is with these little things that we say to each other sometimes is that it can make it seem like forgiveness is easy, and so if you're struggling with it, if it feels difficult, if it feels heavy, that's there's something wrong with you. Forgiveness isn't easy. Look at that cross. That wasn't easy. That was the price tag of our forgiveness. And so forgiveness is not easy. It's going to be a challenge. It's going to be difficult. It's also not a response to an apology. So I have three kids, nine, six, and three, and um, you know, they're always bickering. It's, it's kids, it's like you know, animal kingdom sometimes in the, in the back room of our house. And what I've done in the past is I've, I've brought one over and now what are you gonna say to your brother? I'm sorry, and now what do you say? It's okay, no, you say I forgive you. And I'm gonna stop doing that. Because that's teaching them that when somebody says you're sorry, then you say you forgive them and you hold that I forgive you until that moment and that's wrong. Forgiveness is not a response to an apology. It's offered before. Because how could we say, all right, God, I'd love to honor what you say here. I'd love to forgive, but I need that person to apologize first. So my obedience is based on their obedience. You got to get to them first. And what about those cases where it's just not possible? That person doesn't think that they're wrong, that they did anything wrong. You ever meet one of those people? <laughs> it's just like, bro, everybody around you knows that like, you messed up. Like, read the room. Say you're sorry for Pete's sake. Um, 
What about people who have passed on? You don't have that opportunity to get an apology. So forgiveness is not a response to an apology. It's also not silence. Forgiveness is not silence. Churches have made huge mistakes and caused further wounding to people who have suffered because they've said, all right, now, hey, if you've really forgiven, you can't say this to anybody. You can't pursue some sort of justice. You can't pursue some sort of legal action because that would make the church look bad. You don't want the church to look bad. You don't want the pastor to look bad, the leader to look bad. You don't want Jesus to look bad, right? So you gotta keep this, just keep it quiet. Forgiveness is not silence. Justice should be pursued. When, when Jesus is saying, as we have forgiven our debtors, he's not saying that we've never told anybody. We've never pursued justice. Forgiveness is not silence. It's also not trust. I want you to imagine that uh, I'm a banker and you come to me and you're like, I'd like a $10,000 loan, please. And I say, here you go. You got 12 months to pay it back. And after month 11, I haven't heard from you. So I just give you a call like, hey, what's going on? Haven't, haven't gotten any payments on that loan. And you said, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, ca I can't pay it back. Okay, all right, so I guess we'll just write that one off as a loss. And the next day you show up and you say, hey, I'd like another $10,000 loan, please. Those are two different things. The debt was canceled, but that doesn't mean that you get another loan necessarily. And uh, Dr. Henry Cloud, he wrote a, a series along with another author called Boundaries that some people in our church have gone through. And um, in the Boundaries series, he says that forgiveness for the past doesn't mean trust in the future. The Bible says that you're to guard your heart. It is the wellspring of life. You think about it with like security clearance. If somebody hacks your system or somebody steals something, you, you revoke their security clearance. You don't let them back in where they were. And in the same way, in our hearts and in our souls, there are some people who can't handle that level of clearance yet. And so just because you've forgiven them doesn't mean that you give them the same trust that they had beforehand. It's also not reconciliation. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. Make no mistake that reconciliation is a beautiful, a God-honoring thing. The whole gospel is a story of reconciliation. We were reconciled to God through Christ. But reconciliation takes two people. Reconciliation requires somebody on the other side that says, look, I can admit where I was wrong. We can agree to the rules of the relationship. If we're playing hockey and I say, hey, why don't you come join us? And I find out that your hockey rule book says that you can hit people over the head with your hockey stick any time that you want, you can't play. We can't play together until we can agree that certain things are out of bounds, certain things are against the rules. And so forgiveness, while it has an eye to reconciliation, while it opens the door for reconciliation, it requires something of the other person. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. It's also not forgetting. Forgive and forget, right? Nonsense. How can you forget some of the wounds that you've suffered? And if you forgot them, how could you forgive them? So like, like logically, it doesn't even make sense. But I think there's a more subtle version of this in our culture today where it's not so much forgetting as it is justifying or excusing or minimizing. Again, I point you to the cross and I say, does that look like God minimizes or excuses? Like sin, oh, it wasn't really that bad. You had a lot going on. There's a lot of that happening these days. And so when we look at this cross, we are reminded that God takes the debt very, very seriously. It's not a minimizing. Even when Jesus, he says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. He's using the word debt. He's saying that there's a sum that was owed. There was something that was broken, something that is needed to be repaid when he uses that word debt. So it's not minimizing. It's not sweeping it under the rug. It's not saying it's okay. It's acknowledging that there was a wrong done, that there was a sin that was committed. There was a hurt that was suffered. It acknowledges that. It doesn't run away from that. It doesn't minimize it. It doesn't try to hide it, regardless of what was going on in the other person's life. So it's not forgetting. It's not justifying. It's not minimizing. It's not excusing. It's also not a feeling. I had a lot of conversations with people over the last couple of weeks where they said, you know, but John, I'm still, I feel such hurt and I've got anger towards that action. And I'm just, I'm sad because things changed when that happened. Doesn't that mean that I haven't forgiven that person? And I said, no, it doesn't mean that you haven't forgiven that person. Forgiveness is a little bit like a seed. You know, so I got some, uh, some sweet corn here. I know it's getting to be the spring, but never too early to think about that nice sweet corn at the fall festivals. Um, and I want you to imagine, I open this seed up and I put it into this bucket with soil. Where's the corn? <coughs> they said there was corn in here. I don't see any corn. I come back a day later. 
a week later, a month later, where's the corn? I'm not harvesting any corn out of this. And it's because they're two different things. Forgiveness is the choice to put the seed in the ground, put the seed in the soil. It is a willful choice. How that choice starts to grow and develop and permeate the rest of our lives and bear fruit in beautiful and amazing ways, that takes time. Those are two different things. Pastor Tim Keller said it this way. He said, forgiveness is granted before it is felt. And so some of us may be thinking, I haven't forgiven that person because I still feel hurt by it. I still feel angry at what they did. Well, God felt angry at what they did. He doesn't like think lightly of sin and brokenness and the evil that people do in this world. Jesus got angry. The scripture doesn't tell you don't be angry. It says be angry, but don't sin. And what about grief? Brene Brown, uh, some of you may be familiar with her, she talks about how forgiveness is so challenging to so many people because it involves a death of sorts. Who this person was in our mind, the life that we were going to have, the life that we thought we would have with them, now it's different. And so you grieve in the same way you would grieve the loss of a loved one. You grieve that different future. God is an anti-grief. Jesus wept. He says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. The Bible is not, God is not about shove your feelings down and shove them to the side. It takes a while, though, for that choice to forgiveness to integrate all of those feelings, that whole cocktail, the whole bit. And God say, watch how I pull all these together and I make it bloom and produce something that goes exceedingly abundantly beyond what you could ask or imagine. It's not a feeling. And lastly, it's not optional. I know I've been in services where I've heard somebody teaching about forgiveness and I'm like, yeah, but you didn't mean that person. (laughs) If you knew, um, you know, like I, I, that person should have known better. That person did too much wrong. That you, John, you don't understand what that person stole from me. There's no, there's no loopholes here. There's no caveats. There's no like workarounds here. When Jesus says, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, he's talking about the whole spectrum, the fight that you had with somebody on the way over here or this morning the little paper cuts that we suffer from people on a regular basis, that, and then all the other stuff, the stuff that we don't tell people ever happened to us, the stuff that irrevocably shaped our life, all of that, even that, John, that's what Jesus says, as we have forgiven our debtors. It's not optional. It's not easy. It's not trust. It's not reconciliation. It's not a response to an apology. It's not a feeling, it's not forgetting, but it's not optional. So that's what forgiveness is not. What is forgiveness then? Here's how we're gonna define forgiveness. It's choosing to pay a debt that you're owed. Choosing to pay a debt that you're owed. The word there, forgive, in Jesus' language there in this passage, it means, it's a two-part word, it means to send away from. And so when you use it in a a phrase with the word like debt, you're talking about canceling a debt. But I would ask you, if you cancel a debt that's owed to you, who paid that debt? To go back to our banker illustration, that $10,000 that the person couldn't pay and the bank just writes it off, they eat the cost, who paid for that 10,000? They did. And so whenever we choose to forgive, we're choosing to pay what somebody else owes. That's why the word gives in there. And so we're choosing to pay what somebody else owes. They owe it to us. How does that work out in practical life? Let me give you just three quick dimensions. Number one, individually, is that I, if I forgive, I choose to not see that person as a one-dimensional figure who is only the wrong they've done. I'm not going to see them as a one-dimensional figure. I will continue to see them as made as the image of God. I will continue to see them as somebody who deserves dignity and worth. I won't let them be wrapped up into this one little caricature of the wrong that they've done. So quick example, driving home last night on the Southern St. Parkway, it's a, you know, a monsoon out apparently, and you know, people drive like maniacs and somebody cuts off the car or somebody makes a, an erratic turn or says, I'm in the left lane, but I'll get off at this exit with 12 feet to spare. What do we think about that person? The only thing I know about that person is the kind of car they drive and the way that they're driving it. And I don't like either. And so that person is like, look at this moron. You know, like unbelievable, these kinds of people. Must be nice to have the whole world revolve around you. What is that? (laughs) But reducing somebody to one thing that they've done. And friends, we have such a tendency to be able to do that in our minds. And when that happens, we say, no, I put that seed in the ground. I paid that debt. They are more than that. And that's hard. It's not easy. 
Secondly is that if that person is still in your life to a degree and you have a relationship with them, it means that you don't hold it over their head every opportunity that you get. Hey, could you grab me a, a Pepsi when you're on your way back from the kitchen? Oh, did I sense a hesitation there? Do I have to remind you how many things I've forgiven you from? Do I have to remind you about our conversation from last week? I didn't, bring it up. I didn't want to bring it up, but you made me bring it up because you hesitated about the Pepsi. It could very easily work its way out there, but if that debt is canceled, then it's like, I can't, it's not a weapon. I can't use it against that person. And then lastly, socially, it means that I don't tell everybody who will listen. Remember, forgiveness is not silence. I'm not saying don't tell people, tell the right people, but it doesn't mean you have to tell everybody. And that's a difference. Some of us would be checking out at Stop and Shop and be like, oh, yeah, see, you got some sweet corn. I planted some of that myself the other day. Hey, did I tell you what this person did to me? Yeah. You got five minutes? You don't. All right. Well, well, we'll wait. I'll just tell you the whole story. And you just tell everybody because you're so hurt and you're so wounded that you just needed to get out. And if I've canceled that debt, if I've paid with that person, oh, I'm not going to do that. And so internally, it's not there a one-dimensional finger, uh, figure. Uh, I'm not going to hold it over their head for the rest of their life. I'm not going to tell everybody who will listen. That's what it means to cancel a debt that you're owed, to pay the debt on that person's behalf. And that's what forgiveness means. So that being said, now we can work back into this phrase and see what Jesus is saying here kind of in total. He says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear that, it sounds almost a little bit like Jesus says, if you're a forgiving person, God will forgive you. Like it's an if then. Like you can, you can earn forgiveness from God if you do enough good things. Forgive people and then God will wipe away your debt. Cancel the debt of others, pay the debt on their behalf and God will pay the debt on your behalf. And when you read a little bit further, Jesus does something he doesn't do with any other part of the Lord's prayer. Uh, he gives like an, an epilogue. So in verse 14, he says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. John, doesn't that sound a little bit like Jesus is saying, and if then, like if you forgive other people, then, I mean, that's literally what it just said. But that's not true. When, when you zoom out to the, to the ministry of Jesus' life, right? We're always supposed to be looking what's going on around. Zoom out to the ministry of Jesus' life and then zoom out to the entirety of Scripture. Here's what you find is that all of us are broken and broke. We've damaged God's stuff. We owe God a debt and we have monopoly money with which to pay it back. So I think about when I was... Um, when I was in, I think, maybe second or third grade, I was playing baseball in the backyard, I was, which by that I mean I was throwing the baseball off of the, my parents' vinyl siding, the second floor, and I was pretending like I was catching pop flies in the outfield of the New York Yankees. Nothing against our Met fans, but when I was in first grade, the girl I was dating, the Mets decided to trade her father to the Colorado Rockies, hated them ever since. <laughs> so I'm pretending that I'm catching pop fly out there with Bernie Williams in the outfield and everything great like that. And, and I guess I was just holding the seam wrong and when I threw it. It just veered off a little bit, but too much in the sense that it crashed through my sister's bedroom window, broke all the glass. And I'm thinking, I'm a dead man. Like, I'm like eight, nine years old, maybe. Like, do you know any eight or nine year old who knows the cost of a window? I'm like, I think it's a million dollars. Like, so I'm like going through my baseball cards being like, maybe this Mark McGuire's worth something, you know, like maybe I could sell that before my dad gets home because I owe a debt and I have nothing to pay with it. And that's our state spiritually. Friends, make no mistake, this is not a passage where Jesus is saying, if you try hard enough, you do enough good works, you forgive people, then God will forgive you. You can build a stairway to heaven. He's not saying that at all. The Apostle Paul is writing to a, church, a group of churches in Asia in the book of Galatians, and he says, if righteousness comes through your own moral effort, if you can make things right with God, if you can pay off the debt by your good works and your forgiveness, then Christ died for nothing. Who would say that? Thanks for coming, but I had it under control. Nobody. And then what do you do with Jesus' statement? On the night he's betrayed and he's, he's about to be arrested, he's telling his disciples, I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to have a relationship with the Father except through me. No, friends, we are broken and we are broke. There is no way for us to build some stairway to heaven by our good works, whether that be forgiveness or anything else. And so what is Jesus saying here then? Two things. The first one is that we all need forgiveness. Forgive us, all of us. The starting point is that we all need forgiveness. 
Now this is important because this can get obscured. I think right now, probably all of us are like, yeah, I'm, I'm in church. I understand, John. I need forgiveness. Like, wow, remarkable. But like the idea that when somebody wrongs us, something changes in our brain. They become like a caricature of who they really are. We've seen these before, right? The artists, they take a picture of your face and they, they kind of like draw it and everything like that. And they, they make one feature of your face predominant as like comical. Um, so you've seen these with political cartoons. Every political cartoon you've ever seen is a caricature. But they take one thing and they blow it up to overshadow the rest of who that person is. And we do the same thing. When somebody wrongs us, we let that color the entirety of who they are. We have a hard time seeing them as made in the image of God because of what they've done. And we can fixate on what they've done wrong. And that starts to eclipse all the things that we've done wrong. And so Jesus is in this prayer reminding us that we are to say that, hey, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Nobody earns their way in, which means that I am a fellow sinner, a fellow broken person with this person who wounded me. It's only when I see myself and I identify myself as somebody equally as in need of mercy as that person that forgiveness is even a possibility. But we don't like that because we would much prefer that there were like Christians who needed forgiveness and then Christians who really needed forgiveness. <laughs> That's where we're a lot more comfortable because if there's a two-tier system, then that makes us feel a little bit better, a little bit more worthy, a little bit more like we, we had a little control over God's forgiveness. And Jesus tells a story about this in Luke chapter 18. He says, there's two guys who go to the temple to pray before God, and one is a Pharisee. And so one of them is a religious elite, right? He has chunks of the Bible memorized. He knows all the traditions, all the rules, all the regulations, and he walks around knowing it. And his prayer, this Pharisee, is, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Swindlers, adulterers, evildoers, and this guy. I fast twice a week. I give 10% of everything that I get, even my tax returns. God, thank you for me. I could kiss myself, I'm so pretty. Like that's, that's this guy's prayer. But Jesus says there's a second guy and the second guy is a tax collector. Now, um, tax collectors are not really super um, loved in our society either, but these were tax collectors raising money for the Roman Empire. So an opposing force that's destroying our national identity. That's the idea that Tax collectors are not big fans of people, and people are not very big fans of tax collectors. Uh, maybe an easier way to think about it is if you live in a world where there's like a certain section or group of people, and they're destroying our country, like whoever that is for you, imagine somebody who's raising millions of dollars for that group. That would be how they would have viewed a tax collector. The, these people are raising money for people who are destroying us. And so there's, obviously there's, this is the bad guy in the story. And the text says, Jesus says, that this guy comes before God and he won't even look up. But he's looking down and he's slamming his chest in contrition, in grief, in lament. And he said, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Those are the two options. It's, you can go to God and you can say, look at my scorecard, look how well I'm doing. I'm doing better than this guy. Or you can go to God and say, God, the only way that we have a relationship is if it's on your mercy. I have nothing. And Jesus flips the script on everybody. He says, one of those guys went home justified. One of those guys went home with their debt paid. One of those guys went home listened to, and it wasn't the Pharisee. It wasn't the good guy. It was the tax collector. Friends, we all need God's forgiveness. We all need God's mercy. And that's the starting point. I have to identify myself. I am a fellow recipient of God's mercy. Only then is forgiveness even possible. You think about the song, Jesus paid it all. It wasn't like I paid a little bit of my debt and he covered the balance. He covered the spread. No, Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe. The book of Colossians, the Apostle Paul is writing to a church and he says that when we were dead in our transgressions, Christ made us alive, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of all the things that you and I had ever, wrong, ever done wrong, all of our failures, all of our flaws. He took it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, what a picture of how God does not minimize the wrong that was done and yet he willingly pays for it on our behalf. Did you or I earn that? No. What about amazing grace? How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. 
that sound like somebody who's going before God with a scorecard and a resume? How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. Friends, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And it is only when we come to that idea and we say, God, forgive me. That is the only way the forgiveness of others is even a possibility. The first thing is that we all need forgiveness. The second thing is that we all need to forgive. It's not optional, remember? And if you remember the prayer, we said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I can't pray for God's kingdom and God's will and then not start to extend the mercy that God has allowed me to embrace. Can't do that. There's a disconnect there. I want you to think about who, who those people are that you need to forgive. You know, maybe for a lot of us, it's ourselves. Maybe there's things that we've done, said, not done, not said. And we, we just feel the guilt and the shame that comes with that. Those five things that we did and we're like, I'm never telling anybody about that. I'm just going to keep that in my back pocket and carry that weight for the rest of my life. Maybe today God wants to lift your head and say, no, 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 you're standing looking at your feet. You can look at me because that debt is paid. You need to forgive yourself today. Maybe it's somebody else, somebody who stole years of your life from you. Somebody who did something that changed the course of your life. Maybe it's somebody who betrayed you. Maybe it's somebody who let you down. This happens even in church. Some of the biggest struggles that I have is not forgiving people who don't believe what I believe, it's forgiving the people who do. And so who do we have to forgive today? Because it's not, it's not optional. It's not easy, but it's not optional. This is what we are called to do. Now, there is the tendency to say, yeah, well, that's different. And Jesus tells a story about that. You can read it in Matthew 18. He said, there's this guy who he comes before this king and he owes the king a lot of money. He made some mistake. We don't know what it is. And that misses the point. The, the main idea is that this guy owes half a trillion dollars to this king. All right, so whatever it was, it was bad. Cover like Newsday, New York Post, the whole bit. Breaking news, right? This guy owes lots and lots of money. And he says to this king, he says, give me a little time to pay this back. I just picked up some extra hours at Ralph's Italian Ices. So like you give me... You give me a little bit of time and I will pay you what I owe. The king's response is, I'm actually just going to cancel the debt. Now again, who pays in that case? The king. That was his half a trillion dollars to gain. And now he just wipes it, wipes it off the ledger. So this guy just got forgiven half a trillion dollars. And you would think that this guy would walk out into the hallway, and he would just lean into a Broadway musical. You know what I mean? Like there's a dance number. It's like La La Land or whatever. Like I had a debt that I owed the king, but he forgave me due day. You know, and it's just like <laughs> right on Broadway, like right off Broadway, but right off Broadway. Like it would have just been amazing. The best day of this guy's life because of what he was facing, what he was forgiven. And then he finds a guy who owes him 150 bucks. Now 150 bucks is not nothing. Somebody in this room owes you 150 bucks, you should bring it up to them and say, hey, where are we doing with that 150? Like, how are we coming along with that? So Jesus is not saying that it's nothing, but it's definitely not half a trillion, right? And he finds this guy and he says, hey, uh, what about that $150? You owe me. And the guy says, give me a little bit of time. I'm working on it. I just picked up some extra shifts at Cold Stone and so like I'm gonna be working and, and I'm gonna pay you back. I just need a little bit of time. And the guy says, not good enough. You don't have my money today? Get him in jail. And exactly, the crowd hearing Jesus tell the story would be like, who would do that? Who would lose sight of all that they had been forgiven and then find somebody and hold it over their head that they didn't get something significantly less returned to them? And friends, when you and I say, I will embrace your forgiveness, God, but I'm not going to extend that to this person, we're doing the very same thing. That's the story that Jesus tells. Which brings us to the question, is it possible though? Like I know if we had time and we could say, um, tell me all of the things that you have against this particular person or that particular person. Like there are some incredibly serious things that have happened. And please hear me say that this is not minimizing. 
It's not excusing. It's not justifying. It's not saying there's no dead and sweeping it under the rug. There's some very serious hearts. With those, is it possible to forgive? I believe that it is. I believe that Jesus calls us to this because it is possible. And when we take that step, not only is our experience of the abundant life that he came here to give us more, not only does it allow for there to be a community that can be unified and to shine the light of God, but it can bring people who are in darkness, far from God, to him because we made the choice to put the seed in the ground, to cancel the ledger, to pay the debt. So I believe that it is possible. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen forgiveness that I've been able to show to people that I didn't think I was going to be able to show. I've seen relationships restored in my life in this church that a betting person would have been like, I'm not taking that bet. That's never going to happen. You scale out even more. I've seen it throughout church history, even locally on this island. I've, I've seen situations where a mother will go around and forgive and tell the story of how this person cost them their kid's life. And they're on a stage with that person sharing about how Jesus enabled them to forgive them. And then one of my favorite stories that I always come back to is uh, with a woman named Corey Ten Boom. She was a Dutch woman, a wonderful woman, brilliant mind. Like if they had X back then, she'd have like a billion followers because just super wise. You probably know some of the things she said without knowing it. Um, but she was a Dutch woman. She was uh, imprisoned with her family and put into a concentration camp. All of them died. Um, her sister was the last one to pass away, and her sister passed away in Robinsbrook concentration camp with Corey being there and having to, to see all that. Um, by some crazy providential thing, two weeks before the entire camp was, was murdered, um, Corey was released. And she dedicated the whole rest of her life to go around and tell people the story of God's love, his mercy, and his forgiveness, this great heavenly father who paid so that whoever believes that Jesus died on that cross for their sins could be reconciled to him and have life now and life forever to the full. She would go around and preach this. And on one particular day, she's preaching this and she notices somebody who walks in the back. He doesn't know her, but she knows him because you don't forget a face like that. And he was one of the guards at the concentration camp. I've had to preach in some awkward situations before, but nothing, nothing near to that. And after the service, he comes forward to her. Now imagine you're her. What's going on? He doesn't recognize her. He says, I was a guard at Robinsbrook concentration camp. And I did terrible things. But I'm a Christian now. And Corey Ten Boom, I ask you for your forgiveness. And in her own words, she said, I couldn't. I could only hate him. But then I said, God, thank you that your love is stronger than my hate. And she shook his hand and she said, I forgive you, brother. If that's possible, anything's possible. Take a deep breath in. Whew. How long can you exhale for? Not too long, right? A couple seconds. Is it possible to keep exhaling? Not unless you inhale. And Jesus sets this up, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's almost like breathing. Breathing in the mercy of the kingdom. God, I thank you for my forgiveness. I'm not trying to acquire forgiveness. I'm remembering that I need forgiveness and I'm grateful that you gave it to me. Breathe in and then breathe it out. I choose to forgive that person. I got all sorts of complicated feelings about it. I got some things I got to work through, some things I got to wrestle through, but I choose to forgive. I'm putting the seed in the ground, canceling the debt, canceling the ledger. I'll pay on their behalf. You see this cycle that Jesus is introducing here in this prayer. Forgive us as we forgive. I embrace the mercy of God and I can extend the mercy of God and I can embrace the mercy of God and extend the mercy of God. So friends, it is possible that we can be people who forgive. So how do we do it? One is that you got to know who. Second thing is you gotta pray for help. You gotta pray for help. Everything in this prayer, the whole entirety of the Lord's Prayer is our dependency on God for everything. I need bread, hello, I need bread. I need protection, I need forgiveness, I need you to lead me, I need you to protect me from the evil one. Everything in this prayer is about God doing something for us because we can't do it ourselves. And then you've got this one verb, as we forgive, the one thing we're responsible for in the entirety of the prayer, why wouldn't we need God for that as well? 
When we put our faith in Jesus and we ask God for forgiveness of our sins so we can have a relationship with him, he gives us his Holy Spirit, part of, uh, part of the Trinity, part of the Godhead is in dwelling within us to create love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness to grow this fruit into something that is beautiful and incredible and exceeds anybody's expectations. And so God dwelling within us to help us. That's what Jesus says. He says, don't worry that I'm going away. I'm going to a cross, but I'm going to send to you the helper, the comforter. And so it's not like we're doing this on our own and just willing it. It's saying, God, I need your help to forgive this person. I don't want to do it. But I thank you that your love is stronger than my hate. And so we pray and we ask God to help us. And he will always answer that prayer. Jesus' friend, John, he, he would later write, this is the confidence that we have before God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that God hears us in what we ask, it's according to his will, we know we've received it. There's no question. I go to God with this person, and I go to God with this request and say, God, help me to forgive this person. He will always help. He will never say no. So who is it? Pray for help, and then pray for them. Oh, I know we don't like this one. We're like, all right, John, I'm not, I'm not going to pray for this person, or I've got some ideas of what I should pray for this person, but that's not our style. Jesus says something right before this prayer. He says, you've heard it say, said, uh, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you to love your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you, and so prove to be children of your Father in heaven, because he's the one who sends the Son on the righteous and the unrighteous, and he sends the rains to bring a harvest on the evil and the good. And so pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who wound you. Pray for those who let you down. Pray for those who betrayed you. Pray for those who stole years from your life. Pray for them. Now, I'm not suggesting that you pray, dear Lord, I just pray for that person, that they would wake up with great skin, (laughs) perfect hair. They did no traffic on the way. And I'm not saying you have to go to that level, but I think we could all agree, God, I just pray that this person would know that they need your forgiveness that they would learn to see how the, the only thing in life that matters is their relationship with you and that receiving that grace and that mercy would cause them to look at themselves and see some of the things that they've done wrong and that they could own that and try to make it right for their part. I think we could all pray that prayer. And I would even suggest to you, when we say forgive us, aren't we kind of already praying for them? Like notice how Jesus doesn't say forgive me. That was the kind of first part to unpack, but he's saying forgive us. We are already praying for these people. Let's just start with praying, God, they need your forgiveness. I pray that they would know that, that they would learn to own what they've done wrong so they could become who you created them to be and not spend eternity separate from you. So who is it? Pray for them and pray for help. Friends, this is so much bigger than one message. Like, uh, honestly, I feel like, man, there's just so much to get into, but that's the time that we have. But I want to tell you this. Please let your struggle become our struggle. Whether it's talking to your life group leader, whether it's getting prayer with our amazing team in the back who would love to pray for you, whether it's writing it down on a connect card, if this is an area where you struggle, we want to help you with that. Don't carry this burden alone. You got questions, you got to work through some stuff. We're here for that. We've got resources, we've got people. Let us help you. Let your burden become our burden. We want to be a church that cares and helps lead you in the way that God has called you to. We want everybody here to know that joy and that peace and that hope that comes from walking in the abundant life that Christ came here to give us. And I believe that if we choose to forgive today, that we'll change, that our church will change, that might even make our island change, and who knows beyond that. We're gonna close in a time of communion, but before we do that, I wanna lead us in a prayer um, of forgiveness. Maybe throughout this, you've been thinking of the same person over and over again. You're like, God, today's the day where I gotta just choose to forgive them. I wanna just give you the language in terms of that, putting the seed into the ground today. And so would you close your eyes and we'll pray this prayer together. If you don't have to pray it out loud. Just pray it in your heart about that person that you've been thinking of for the last half hour. Heavenly Father, thank you for forgiving me, for showing me mercy, for paying my debt. Today, I choose to forgive them. I don't feel it, but I choose it. Help me to remember your forgiveness, to extend 
the mercy I've embraced. Thank you that your love is stronger than my hate. In Jesus' name.